Hey, welcome to theCUBE pod, episode 84. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Salute in person again. Hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, man. What a week. You, you've been a warrior. Uh, Holy cow. Over 40 <laughs> plus interviews, exclusive with Andy Jassy, which we're going to reveal here on theCUBE pod. So stay with us on this podcast. You'll hear exclusive interview with Andy Jassy, who came back after a two year hiatus uh, from coming to AWS with the show he built, reInvent. Um, obviously he turned the world on fire, disrupted the old guard, created the, the, the thing that is cloud computing. Godfather of cloud. And trained the entire business community on how to do cloud right, how to work backwards, and how to create these high level services. So Andy Jassy here on the Cube Pod. Stay tuned, that'll come on shortly. Um, you know, we're here just grinding away, getting the stories, the full team is here, siliconangle.com, Rob Hof, Mark Albertson, the whole team, working on over 50 stories on siliconangle.com, the CUBE research team, all the analysts are here, uh, in the analyst summit, Dave, you were there leading the team, you know, on the ground, you know, winning the trench warfare, getting all the puzzle pieces, squinting through all the news and getting all the analysis, and of course the CUBE team here on a, what I call very agile setup, we are in the press area, and we've been going full throttle for four days. So the team's been amazing. Um, Andrew, Christian, uh, Alex, uh, Anderson, great job guys. Again, pulling the cue pot off. And, but we're totally stoked because it's just been on fire here at reInvent and the news around uh, the internet, Intel, we're going to get to Veeam, uh, financing and all this good stuff. But AWS dropped its holiday charm on the industry <sighs> in ever. classic, classic AWS reInvent fashion, going back to how it used to be. Adam Stileski used to run more of a marketing kind of vibe, um, more of a show, storytelling. This was just old school blocking and tackling, yeah. <laughs> just fire hose of gifts. You know, as some people are saying, it's like it's like Christmas. It's like the holiday. All these gifts are coming. I want to unpack. I want to play with all the new new action. Um, it really, Dave, was a sign of Matt Garman's strong leadership. You know, Jassy trained him well yeah. on how to do these keynotes. So everyone was looking at Matt Garman and saying, "Hey, will he have it? He brought it. Oh, he totally uh, and did." Then surprise guest, Jassy comes out, completely changed the energy in the room. He just delivered, because he's a pro, he's been doing it forever, <laughs> up until two years ago, this was his show, and he was the master at, at laying down, and he handled the big announcements, um, and then also flexed a little bit about, you know, subtly saying, without saying the cliche, we've been doing AI before AI, but he was flexing with data. Here's what we've done at Amazon, here's yeah. what we're doing at AWS, of Do course. Doing internally. Just springing his step, looking like Andy's just, and then the teamwork. Swami's keynote was phenomenal, Werner's keynote and the, and the opening keynote, Peter DeSantis keynote was just phenomenal because it was just, here's all the goodies. It was back to the and Dave Brown of spent, hardware. Dave Brown was part of that Monday. I don't know if you saw that, Dave Brown on Monday night, yeah. giving a master class on storage and JBOD and, yeah. and how they're using Nitro. And, and the, you know, there was an amazing thing on Monday night. Monday nights are just, they're always awesome. The, cr the crowd was, it was packed. Nobody was on their phones and it was like hardcore geeking out. And everybody was just like focused on what Dave Brown and then, and then Peter was saying. I mean, yeah. it was just, so it was Monday unbelievable. Night, so Monday night I'm in the hallway and I'm, I'm going to uh, another event. I missed the keynote, so I had a meeting. But I was with someone from a big company. Mm -hmm. um, that's first time here at reInvent. And we're walking through the main exchange there and it was just a mass rush of people just like, like almost trampling through. There's just so many people. And they were going to the keynote. It was 8.30, okay. <laughs> They're lining up it's for the keynote. Well, it's day zero, and this person says to me, he says to me, where are they going? Is it like a concert? Said, no, no, it's a keynote. <laughs> uh, like now? On a Monday night? Yeah. And, and uh, this company, they have like one keynote. They hope everyone shows up, but yeah. no, no, that's like one of four keynotes. Yeah. And so, and that was kind of a pause moment for someone in the industry to get a feeling of what this conference is all about. Like, there's keynotes that are packed and a stampede, overflow rooms for every single one of them. Peter DeSantos, that's the hardware, the one that James Hamilton used to do, that's all about what's under the hood. The keynote main one, all the announcements, Matt Garman, Andy Jassy, Swami does the whole data with Ruba and partners, and then obviously Werner today with the developer piece. So every single one of them is intentionally 
driven on a, on a script that's packed. And it's always packed, and it's so, so detailed. It's just unbelievable. It's not just, there's not a lot of hand waving yeah. that goes on in this conference, right? It's, yeah. They love to get into the, like even, like I've been saying all week, like the, the SageMaker stuff is, to me is really interesting. <laughs> and they're like, hey, we, we see AI and analytics coming yeah. together because they're using yeah. the same data, and then zoomp, right into the weeds. So, and so, uh, and it, people eat it up. And it was know? great to see Andy back, because I think Andy is and Matt are teamed up. It's like two power players saying, look, we're going to win this game. I mean, let's, game on. let's put the game on. Andy's competitive, so is Matt Garman. The whole team's here. Swami's a great leader. You got Swami heading up AI. Andy back on stage saying, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the team, coach. Put me in, Matt. I'm here to help. Yeah, he Matt's, wasn't. And, and he, Matt's like, I accept all, all of this. No problem. Come he didn't come out and do like the Santa Claus wave and the Macy's parade. I mean, he was out there for 20 yeah. plus minutes he, going deep into the tech, taking us through all the Nova models, right? The, yeah, like, I mean, look, introducing he, he six not, Nova models. He was not models. a set gimmick at all. He's yeah. like, I'm on the team. We, as a Amazonian culture, are going to win this. And so that was great to see that. And, and But again, the choice was, do you let Matt Garman give him enough space? No, 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 he's in. They're in the boat together, and that was a unified front. I thought and, that was phenomenal. And Matt, I thought, so I'll tell you, the, I'll contrast in the analyst session, We've had Jassy for years. It's just Q&A, right? They come in, they say, for an hour, let's, let's talk Q&A. And then Adam, Andy and Adam, would, their answers were always long, you know, and pretty detailed, which was fine, except you didn't get as many questions in. Matt was like, he reeled off so many Q questions and answers. It's it was like home run got, derby. He probably got like, it was a home run derby. Yes, it was like the all-star game. <laughs> Ortiz, boom, there's another one. <laughs> boom, there's another one. You know, he didn't waste a lot of time. He didn't go like off topic. It was really, really good yeah, and, and from I think, that standpoint. I think the favorite moment too, obviously for us, is that Andy took time out of his schedule. The guy is super overbooked to come down and recognize the cube and sit down with us for an exclusive interview. Uh, you're going to hear that here first, um, and then of course we'll be on Silicon Angle. And the cube. I think a lot of that too is the, the trust we we you know built yeah. with Andy way back when when we went down yeah. and met him in New York. He even mentioned that. Yeah. He said, "Remember, you know, Did you'll hear that <laughs> you know that dank dark room, and that's when you wrote the Trillion Dollar Baby, which yeah. was epic." And I think that you know. I think, I think he, he got that we got the cloud at the yeah, time. We've, we've gotten know? to know Andy over the years, as you know, me and you have been, been uh, tight with him. And so, you know, he's, he's also very competitive. He's also sports. But I, I like hanging out with Andy, but I, I, I was going to try to stump him on something. So before we went on camera. This is good. Tell I, the story. I, I went on camera. I'm like, okay, I, I got someone. I'm going to school Andy right now. Because <laughs> okay. he's like a schoolyard boy flipping baseball cards or like we used to do, like, you know, arm wrestling. Okay, I'm going to one-up him. <laughs> Yeah, right. So I say to Andy, Andy, I, this is our 12th reInvent. I think we've been to more reInvents than you. <laughs> of course we have. <laughs> so he doesn't miss a beat and he says, oh, you must know a lot about well, AWS. <laughs> 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 <I'm not CEO. laughs> and, and then doesn't miss a beat and says, we'll have to de-invite you for two yeah, years. Two years so I can catch up. <laughs> you know, the other thing, the other and, thing. I, and I said, oh, that's so classic Andy Jassy. Because it was kind of a fun comment just to kind of you know, you know, needle a little bit on that. But, say, but like, hey, you know, we got you. No, no, no. I'll just delist well, you. And, you know, and, just de-invite you. And uh, the other so. thing, too, he said, you know, and people will hear this. He said, yeah, when we first introduced S3 in 2006, people were like, what are you doing? Like this, that makes no sense. And I remember, you know, being there. I, would, Floyer and I were like, "Oh my God, this is going to change everything. This is incredible." And, and and because we saw storage networks try to do it and do it wrong, yeah, and then yeah. you know, so that we were on it obviously early. And so that I think we made a bet early on 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 this ecosystem. Yeah, and it was pretty it, obvious. We've been on Amazon since off. the beginning. Um, let's get to the Andy Jassy interview a little bit later, so stay tuned, you're going to hear that, we'll do a little intro on that, but let's get some of the news, Dave, because um, a lot of stuff has gone down this week, obviously we can still unpack the, what's going on here, there's a lot to unpack here at reInvent, I'm sure they'll, they'll give us material for at least two more pods, at least, um, but I want to get your take on Intel's huge news where Pat Gelsinger essentially retired, quote retired, um, canned maybe by the board, some say. Um, oh, no question, he got fired. I mean, it's the, I mean they let him retire. They said, Pat, you, you, you got a choice, I'm sure. Retire or you're going to get fired. I mean, there's no way that, was, that happened that fast and that wasn't a firing, right? But it was his choice to, yeah, how, it was, fired. how it was played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I'm going to retire. to retire versus get fired tomorrow. So, yeah, I mean, I'll take us through your analysis, because again, we've been on this, so people, if you listen to this QPod, you know that Dave and I have been talking about this for a long time. Other analysts we, that are out there with cold takes, 
were like, oh, Intel's got a tailwind. Um, you know, putting lipstick on that. Um, Intel's been trying to, you know. to market its way out of the problem, but you can't market your way out of the, the problem. But he inherited of bad cards. Okay. Yes. But, yes. Give but, us unpack okay. why Intel. Let so, I mean, we Pat go back Gelsinger. to. So in the the just the the risk of being repetitive. The Intel's problem started in 2012, when PC volumes peaked, and you can go back before that, when the real problem started, when they passed on the iPhone, because they said there's no market there and there's not enough business and we can't make money. So ARM stepped in and said, okay, we'll do it. Well, the reason why those two points are really, milestones are really important is because when PC volumes peaked, that set in motion ARM volumes overtaking uh, PC volumes, and, it, and they did. And so in semiconductor manufacturing, volumes win. And we've been saying this over and over and over. Everybody knows Moore's Law. We talk about Wright's Law. I'm not going to go into Wright's Law, but look it up. And that's what the problem was. We have been talking about this literally since 2012, 2013. In September of this year, you remember Patrick Moorhead came out and said um, that it now is not the time to split off Foundry. We wrote a piece of special breaking analysis, Florian and I saying, no, now is the time. That, years ago was the time, but they, they're, they're going to run they're out of denial. money. Right, and, and so unless, we said at the time, unless Intel has unlimited capital, which they don't, that they're going to go bankrupt. And so that's what was happening here. It was they look at the numbers and they said, this is not going to work. We have to do something different. So now, I'm not sure what's going to happen. They're talking about you know, fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility is they got to figure out how to spin out foundry so that they won't continue to be an albatross on the design business. And I think, here's my scenario, I think private equity probably is, has some interest. My scenario, which probably is not going to happen, is that I think that Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Meta and maybe Nvidia and maybe some others should be taking their balance sheets and putting in 50 billion and match the 50 billion dollars that the government has in the CHIPS Act, come up with 100 billion dollars and, and spin out Foundry and then you know, recap it and then save Intel. And it's going to take 10 plus years to do that. And I say as a, as a quid pro quo, the US government should get its foot off the necks of big tech and big tech should step up because they have skin in this game. But I asked Matt Garman in the Q&A, what he thought about that. I said, is it, I said, is it important to have US-based manufacturing? Yes, is it important that that is a US headquarters company? He said, no, I'm not sure about that. And then would you be willing to, to fund it as I just described? And he said, eh, I'm not sure I'm willing to fund it. So they don't want to do that, obviously. They're, all these guys are essentially getting a free ride. A free ride yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I mean you know, free ride in quotes. Amazon bought Annapurna for a reported $350 million, probably one of the greatest acquisitions in the history of, of enterprise tech. That and VMware. From a value are, perspective. Are, yeah, from, from a return and value and VMware, strategic value. I think value. VMware and Annapurna are definitely up v, there. Those two have to be, right? What, nothing else is even close. What, what else do you put there? You know, PwC saved IBM. Sun and Sun and um, um, Oracle with Sun was very interesting. It was an IP but, transfer, but yeah, but not even close to what Annapurna is throwing off. It gave them Nitro, it gave them Graviton, Inferentia, Tranium. I mean, their whole playbook of silicon, amazing acquisition. And they're getting good at it too. And so, so, so free ride in the sense that they had the foresight to buy that company and get off the x86 crack. <clears throat> and so, does to that. That's what I mean by, by free ride, and the ARM model of being fabulous, and the fact that TSM is, did all the dirt, is doing all the dirty work, allows companies like Apple, and Tesla, and Amazon, and now Google, certainly Google, but not now um, Microsoft, to design their own silicon, yeah. and they don't have to make it. They don't have yeah. to own the fab. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing model, but so it's, the question is, you know, how do we save Intel, and is it important to save Intel? Or do you just basically say, do what happened to Global Foundry, say, you know, give up on, on advanced manufacturing, and then give it all to TSM? Which, you look at, Frontline just came out with um, a new series, or a new episode, on um, the rise of Xi Jinping. And basically, he says, I'm going to take Taiwan, either by force or by coercion. It's going to happen. So something's got to give. 
in and the United States. A whole other Cold War is, or a war could potentially be there. It could be a hot war. This could be a national those, security foundry. It has to be in the U.S. I think so. Now, Floyer's scenario is, look, just give it all to TSM. Let them build it here. But, mm, okay, but if that's a Chinese-owned company at some point in time, yeah. you know, I, so I feel like it does have to be a U.S.-based headquartered company. And I think, I think Garmin... Well, the question, can they get across the finish line? What time frame could this be up and running? And does the market shift? John, does it matter? The time frame is literally 10 to 15 years. And who's got the stomach for that? And then Matt, when he was given the answer to me, he was like, eh, and Intel's on a path. And I was like, I made a face. And you know, I was sitting in front row and he looks at me, he goes, well, you know, they got troubles. <laughs> they are not on a path. They are on a path that's a, a, a spiral downwards because of foundry. And so something's got to give there. I feel like it's really, really important that the government and these big tech companies step up and, yeah. and save Intel, but the, nobody's got, nobody, why do they want to spend billions of dollars doing that? It's but, a corporate development play right now. To me, Foundry, Intel, it's all corp dev. What's it worth? You know, Gordon Gecko, sell the hangers to the to little Toll Brothers. Let's, we're going to move the quick think, condos over there. I mean, that's what think, has to go think down. Think about this. Marvell's like, I don't know, five, six billion dollar company. They have the same valuation of Intel. Intel's a 50, 60 billion dollar company. With, this, with the, the 80, 90 billion dollar valuation. So, you know, something's got to give there. Maybe private equity takes them. If I, if I were private equity, I'd take them and say, okay, let's do what Global Foundries did. We'll just make chips for cars. Yeah. And, you know, TVs. And Marvel we'll make money had, at Marvel that. had a pretty good quarter. No, Marvell so, had a great quarter. So talk about Veeam raising $2 billion around ahead of an IPO. So Veeam, really interesting let's here. Get, Veeam, let's get the scoop on Veeam. Veeam <laughs> you know, Veeam was owned by these, you know, two two Russian entrepreneurs for years, and they would have these crazy parties at, yeah, in go Vegas, to all and they were, they, they were they, awesome. They owned VMware and they, backup. And, and they, they were, they were, yeah, that's right. They were brilliant marketers. Yeah, they, they were named, targeted. They named the company Veeam, and they started in VMware backup, and everybody thought they were VMware, so everybody bought their backup, and it was a great product, and it was just yeah, genius. They were, yeah, they, yeah. And they, had, they were green everything, big parties. Well, anyway, they ran the company you know, up, and made it profitable, and they sold it to Insight, for $5 billion just before COVID, so this is 2020. But it was all kinds of convoluted, you know, Russian stuff. Back then, you know, Russia, Russia Gate, all this stuff was going on. So Insight had to clean that up. And, they, and Anand Erswan, who the new CEO, he had to come in and clean that stuff up. And, and yeah. they couldn't even do business with the U.S. government at the time. Now they have a huge U.S. government business. Well, anyway, fast forward to 2024, Veeam just announced on December 4th that they raised uh, two billion, that, 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 that Insight is selling Two billion dollars um, in investment for, in Veeam for two billion dollars uh, at a at a fifteen billion dollar post. So I did the math on this um, back when I was meeting with Veeam, and they were giving me all their metrics, and I came up with fifteen point three billion dollars was there was there based on what Cohesity's trading at and Rubric and Commvault. So a fifteen billion dollar post is a two billion dollar discount for the investors, which frankly is not huge. So, you know, Veeam's probably going to have to crank up its growth a little bit. I think that's going to be a rocket IPO. Oh, yeah, I think I mean, so, too. This company Definitely. gets cleaned up. The founders it is cleaned up. It, it's cleaned up. They're, the, they're, the founders they're cashed out. They got a 29% EBITDA. E Insight right is good. I mean, they're going to yeah. take this thing monster IPO. So they just took $2 billion off the table, and they're, now they're playing with house money. Yeah. It's like a beautiful move. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember private equity used to be just suck all the cash flow out yeah. and just leave the carcass for Broadcom or something, yeah, you know, a, whatever. There's a, growth, right? there's a growth playbook with, with yeah. later stage right now, and this is yeah. one great example of it. Well, I mean, look, at the, 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 the market's changing, and again, if I look at AWS's reInvent this year, coming back here, and set up to end the interview, um, they really, and I wrote a post on this, which I ended up nailing the keynote, actually, with the Matt Garman Oh, you, your post was um, great. The, the back to basics happened. There was definitely their back to their basics. The first two slides of his opening keynote sequence went the following. First slide, a, a shout out to the community and the heroes specifically, which was, that is a huge gesture to the community. Second one, I love developers, laptop sticker, 
developers are near and dear to my heart, the quote I had in my article, so again, he's reiterating, and he's been consistent on that, by yeah. the way. Since he's been CEO, I've been pressing him, don't lose the developers. He's like, no, we will not lose the developers, we will not lose the founders. They, he's hardcore on that. So those were the two opening sequences. And then in the keynote, we didn't hear about agents until an hour and a half right. in. Because he went right to security, and then he went right to the infrastructure. He went to the core jewels. Yep. Yep. And that's where their competitive advantage. So, you know, Andy Jassy, you know, and these guys don't like to play their cards if they don't have to, but they played a lot here, Dave. They've showed, they showed, at least me, from what I can see, that Andy and Matt are teaming up. It's a team and you got Swami, and you got the whole management team. They're, they got some great management. They're in the arena. They're going to compete, and they're going to go to their strength and their core competency, and they're going to go to where they're going to win. Well, the big artillery is infrastructure, and then software innovation at the bedrock model SageMaker layer, and they're going to create an environment for the best place to do generative AI apps. And I think they're saying, hey, we're going to play the long game because we don't see those apps coming yet. I mean, yeah, there's some stuff out there, and there's some use cases, but as we've been saying on theCUBE, until the infrastructure's done, it's way too costly, not predictable, and they've done, they're doing the work. They're doing the work under the covers um, where that needs to be done, and like I said, the old days was spin up some servers, some EC2, loads my app and run it on the web, my web app on Amazon. Doing that kind of ease of use with large scale supercomputer clusters is freaking hard. Dave Brown laid it out to me before, DeSantos and Brown gave the master class, and I guarantee you there might be a scenario where even if NVIDIA and the others have the best AI systems on-prem, it's just, it won't be as good. I mean, there's well, a chance that that entire on-prem market could crater, except for use cases that are connected to the cloud. So it's it's going to be a very interesting situation interesting. Uh, uh, to I look mean, at. It's certainly not the story you're hearing from Dell and HPE and Lenovo, you know, I love the AI, you know I love the AI factory yeah. positioning. I think companies will have AI factories, but the, to me, I think what's going to end up happening is the reality will set in, like, we just can't do stuff at the scale of the, of the what I call A plus hyper, uh, hyperscalers. And I don't, I don't put Microsoft in that category. Well, so, I put them in the B category. Well, they're a, they're a know, hyperscaler. I put them in the A category of M&A. <laughs> and, wait, wait, and, wait, wait, okay. Well, this is interesting. Okay, yeah. so you, you, but they are a hyperscaler. I mean, there's three, right? Three true hyperscalers. I mean, they're technically, right? they're in that. You no, know, they're yeah, they're. If I had the grade, I'm not B league, but they're like Amazon's an A but plus. But here's the thing, I want A plus infrastructure hyperscaler. Would you agree? Yeah, for IS and PES. But so here's the thing: the narrative has been Amazon's behind yeah. in AI. Why is that? Why? Because people are looking at their LLMs and going, eh, you know, Titan, and it's and, true. And, that's, and, that's, and, 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 and that's you know, not Olympus, wrong. and no, and we'll see Nova. We'll see how that plays. But what everybody's missing is. Who's making all the money in AI right now? It's yeah. it's and, the picks and shovels. And it's what the AI, infrastructure. And what AI apps are out there? But but I mean, outside of like OpenAI and but, Anthropic but stick model. with me on yeah. this. So who's making money? Nvidia's making money. Who, who's number two in, in AI? I'd say Broadcom. Or Amazon's right there, right? The hyperscale Google. I mean, these guys. Well, you're are, picks and shovels, and then, or it, you're making AI technology. Or you're selling ads. Google and, and Meta. Okay. So what did Amazon do that Microsoft couldn't do? So Amazon Inf build a real infrastructure. So, so they all they all lining up to get GPUs from yeah, that's from, true. From, from 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 Jensen. No, we have Blackwell. No, we have Blackwell. Okay, everybody's got Blackwell now. All right, Michael Dell has it. Amazon has it. Everybody has it. What does Amazon have that these other guys don't have? They have they Tranium. have inferential and Tranium, which is low cost training. So they could say, okay, let's train on Tranium. Yeah, it's not as powerful as the GPUs from Nvidia but it's, it's good enough to start learning and in building. In a clustered scenario. In a clustered scenario and building the tools around it. And what's, a really, what's one of the most important things in, in AI is networking, you know, something yeah. you know a little yeah, bit about. Exactly. So they're now able to train models on their own infrastructure without having to rely on in, NVIDIA's InfiniBand. Yeah. So they're doing it at much lower cost and they're building, so the, the point is they're on the S-curve. Whereas Microsoft couldn't do it because they couldn't get enough GPUs, they didn't have an inf a, a Tranium equivalent, and so what'd they do? They said, all right, we're going to train Excel and, and Office, all the productivity apps. Okay, fine, nice, and that's why that opened the door for Benioff to call it Clippy. Now yeah. Google doesn't have that problem because Google has, Google has good hardware. TPUs, and yeah. they've been on Google, this for a while. Google's so good Google and, and, and Amazon 
have really, really strong infrastructure. Yes. Great tech. Totally agree. Right? Both and so, A players. And you know, Microsoft, so now. They're just a B player. And now you've got OpenAI, and Sam Altman's running around, who knows what shell game he's playing. And you know, the, the Anthropic piece, we were talking to Howie Shu about this you know, recently, Anthropic looking pretty, like a pretty good I, I move. I think the Anthropic, with the collaboration, and if they can get access to what uh, Amazon's doing at that cost, and then can be trained closer to the hardware, that could be, and if they're collaborative, which we've been seeing here, and that's the feedback we've been seeing, that they're very collaborative. You had dinner with the execs there. So, I mean, we're going to see. At the end of the day, there's, there's picks and shovels. Here's the AI landscape. People sell picks and shovels. There's people building AI technology. So they're, they're AI builders. Then you have AI consumers, people who consume the technology. And then you have data providers. The dirty little secret in the AI world, if, if being judged as an AI player is having an LLM or a foundation model, and by the way, that, I don't think that's the definition. The dirty little secret is everyone has the same corpus of data on the internet. So it's just who's got it better. So that's going to get commoditized when people level up. So data feeding, a data feeder, and the picks and shovels will make money today. Okay, we're a consumer of AI. I'm running a rag app, we're doing all, converting all of this. So we're a consumer of AI. So is J.P. Morgan Chase. Will they start making their own AI? So the, the pool sides of the world have a nice strategy. They're clearly saying we will build, be an AI provider of technology. So they hire the PhDs, they got all the top guys. But most people are going to be consuming the AI and then buying picks and shovels, and then either bringing their own data or getting data fees. Now, if you're an LLM like OpenAI, you got to get data to differentiate. I mean, you need more data. And that's yeah. why the synthetic data is interesting. So you know, the JP Morgan scenario that we wrote. But, but so here's the thing that, that is now blatantly clear that Amazon's taken their Graviton playbook, like Graviton to x86, and they're bringing that to, to inferentia, uh, inferentia and, and Tranium. Yeah. And you know, we'll see about the models. So they're, redu they're reducing their reliance on NVIDIA for, for Gen AI training and inference. So here's this, you know, talked about the cube research. So George Gilbert, is, he goes deep. The in-house Inferentia team says that they're already running Claude 3.5 Haiku, which is the smallest Claude model, on uh, Amazon infrastructure. And they're, they're, they're coming soon to 3.5 Sonnet. Okay, which is the leaderboard favorite right now. And they got a roadmap for running all models. And the Tranium, te Tranium team says they have the software stack, not, not, not just beyond, beyond CUDA, but they, have, they can run CUDA, but they have their own other software to train frontier models on NVIDIA scale clusters, meaning 10 to hundreds of thousands of GPUs. So Claude is on the roadmap for training. And they, then, you know, we'll see about the Nova and house models. The point is that they were able to develop all this tooling. They put them on the, on the S curve, and that is what's going to, you know, help them win. How yeah. were they able to do this? Inferentia, Tranium, and Nitro. Yeah. Right. That's the sort of secret sauce that they have that allows Amazon to to play in this game. Yeah. And they, I think, asserted their leadership in AI. Frankly. Yeah. I mean, I think the playbook is they're going to have more compute than any other cloud. Amazon's playbook is going back to the roots. They, they won by a very simple formula. Be the best and the easiest place to stand up infrastructure run apps. Yeah. So just, it's AI apps now, so they're targeting, they're not going to try to fall into the shiny new toys, hey, I want the best model. So, you know, Nova might not be a big hit, big announcement, but it might not be there long term. We'll see how that plays out. But they're going to be finding the best infrastructure and make it easier for people building AI apps and the most cost effective on AWS. Yeah. That's, their, that's their formula. So the ball is not being hidden anymore. They're playing their cards, and their competitive strategy is clearly infrastructure. That's their bread and butter. That's where they have, they're on the curve, multiple curves now, and you look at all the people, they're getting good at certain so, stuff. You heard, you heard the SageMaker guy saying, we're getting good at this. We're getting, Dave Brown, we're getting good at building silicon. You, you, talk, you talked early on about clustered systems. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. Our, our last back. year. And, yeah, and so but AWS has the infrastructure chops to follow in NVIDIA's footsteps relatively quickly, and yeah. you know, Microsoft doesn't. They yeah. have GPU constraints. Model there. distillization in bedrock, that's going to be a, um, a big but, one. But S3 table buckets is huge. But before we go there, the key for that, I, that I see for Google and Amazon is they're able to uh, like push this, this AI and through their, their, throughout their infrastructure, using their own infrastructure. Yeah. That's big. 
Now, Amp, now maybe it doesn't matter for Microsoft because they throw off so much cash. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> so that's their ace in the hole. But to your point about you know, S3 managed iceberg tables, we'll see. Okay, I reached out to Snowflake for a comment on this and I haven't seen anything yet. I might see it, I, I didn't see it by this morning. Because this, you know, we've been talking all last summer about Snowflake and Databricks and what this all means. So imagine, imagine here's a scenario, here's a scenario we heard today. So, okay, infrastructure, they're playable. Let's get in some of the weeds on why, how wide they're going to make it easy to build apps. Today, if, you, if I'm a user and people who are listening can, can relate to ChatGPT, you take a Word document, Okay, the context window, how many tokens can I, in, in my context window, you go to ChatGPT, everyone's kind of done this, you cut and paste the big long document, you take, actually take a document and you put it into ChatGPT. It could be a 20 page research paper, whatever, yeah. something big. Okay, and it digests it, and you say, summarize this, or what's the key takeaway? The 10 key yeah. points, right? And, and it comes back, okay. That its concept is called feeding AI and you get answers. Imagine pointing like, the bedrock knowledge base is primitive at an S3 bucket that's got you know, 20 petabytes, okay? <laughs> or, you know, um, running bedrock guardrails on, and with reasoning at S3 buckets that has a billion objects, okay? So just the concept of saying, oh, just point to it. Yeah. That is the same as that ChatGPT. That is revolutionary. So I think when you start to see that kind of under the covers activities, now the application developers can just take advantage of that by basically stitching data sets together. That's why the, the, the data conversation, that's why the S3 buckets things are huge. The table formats, cleaning up a lot of that infrastructure gets them building that tooling to your point about SageMaker. I think that's where they win. So again, I am very bullish. Um, I still love the agent stuff because I think that will happen. Multi-agent collaboration, agents of agents. Mm -hmm. But that's too many lily pads, Dave, as we say hop from. Right now mm -hmm. it's just get infrastructure and get it ease of use. I think the whole LLM falling in love with I'm a model, I'm going to build a model. I think that's just going to happen. Models will be there. And I think that's not going to be the benchmark. The benchmark is what apps are hitting. And if you ask yourself, what AI apps are actually out there right now? I open AI, I mean, yeah, ChatGPT, it's, it's, like, it's, I mean. It's the yeah, LLMs, yeah. right, that you see. And some, it's you know, some it's, rudimentary Salesforce, stuff. Salesforce, actually, Salesforce, you know, claims that it, Agent Force was a big driver in the quarter. Okay, but are they apps that, where they're consuming AI to do something, or are they actually they're, doing AI they're, and building they're, an they're app? They're apps that are applying AI to Their existing. AI or someone else's AI? It both. Yeah, it's just, this is, again, yeah. this is where you start to squint through. Of so AI gets embedded in everything. I asked the question to some folks offline, how do you tell a player from a pretender in this market? And which is something- Because there's a lot of agent washing going there's on. There's a lot of pretenders. I got the coolest new thing. That's not really AI, but you're consuming AI and that's cool. Yeah. Like that's not real AI. So there's nothing wrong with it, but you just got to know where you are. You can't say you're real AI when you're not. So you're using AI to do something of benefit. That's cool. It's like a website if you're in the web. You yeah, know? I you got, got a, a search engine. engine. I got a yeah. dot com. <laughs> <laughs> look, look how cool it is. No, but that's that's the way it is. Um, so let's get into the Andy Jassy to preview this. Before we do that, Bitcoin hit 100,000. We have to at least give, give some props to that. It, it, but it couldn't hold it. Couldn't hold 100,000. Yeah, we were right on this. Remember? Well, remember see, you know, yeah, right, I, I do it. remember. Right? We, well, there was a couple things that were interesting on this. One was his election year, Trump. Uh, two is MicroStrategy's uh, Sailor's been talking about this, and I kind of like what I like his narrative. I'm not going to lie; I think uh, Sailor's got it. It's like Bitcoin's a small percentage of st store of value. Some people think it's BS, but you know, I know a lot of crypto whales are getting liquid right now. The, the demand for the, crypto. The is, Fed chairman said yesterday, "quote It's like gold." <laughs> the Fed chairman Powell <laughs> said that. He, yeah. but he did say it's not a store yeah. of value, but he said did say it's like gold. I'm like, wait a minute, isn't gold a store of value? But anyway, yeah, go Bitcoin. <laughs> but you know, Bitcoin, we'll see what Ethereum and Solano come. That's a whole nother conversation. We'll save that for another pod. Yeah, okay. uh, but let's get into the Andy Jassy um, exclusive. Again, we had a chance to um, get with Andy. Um, shout out to him. So let's set this up. He, we met with him down on the show floor. We set up some production there and we got this exclusive interview. We're the only outlet, news or any media that has the exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Andy Jassy. We only had 15 minutes. We did our best to pepper him with some questions, but we wanted to get some thoughtful answers out and we didn't want to ask the classic, hey, I saw Apple on stage. Just, we want to try to get at the heart of how he's thinking, why he came back, what's his mood, is he leaning in and what do you think about the next generation of cloud after building with his team, cloud one, now we're on cloud two. 
Here, here's the interview and enjoy uh, this, this exclusive interview. Hello, welcome to theCUBE's special presentation. I'm John Corey, Dave Vellante for exclusive CUBE coverage. Dave Jackson, the CEO of Amazon, former CEO of AWS. Andy, great to see you. Thanks for having us in your little den here. You should be doing media hits all week. It's great, great to, to be, it's great to be with you guys. This is a tradition. We've done this a lot of years Andy, together. I love the fact that you're doing videos and you film on stage. The energy in the room completely changed when Matt introduces the OG, the godfather of cloud. And then the, just the crowd reaction was pretty strong. Really, you can really feel the energy. And then it's just continued dropping the mega announcement of you know, having to a model. But just in general, since then, it's just been a great event. And uh, my first question is, do you miss it? You're back. Oh, it, it's, well, first of all, uh, I thought Matt did an awesome job in the keynote. And uh, um, it's, it's a thrill to be back. I, I, I love reInvent. There's not a week I like better during the year. I'd miss not being here for a few years. I, I was uh, honored to be back. And you know, one of the things I love about reInvent is that it, it's it, actually the thing I love most about it is the people. You know, just being around our customers. We work so hard all the time and we see all the warts and all the things that we think we can be doing better for customers and that we want to deliver for them and we're, you know, you're, you're kind of heads down. And then to be around all your community partners and your customers and your partners and have them excited. And we hear stories, you know, one of my favorite parts about reInvent every year, and I've heard this at least three times in the last 24 hours, is that people come here to learn from each other and to learn about what they can be doing differently and to be inspired to go back to their own businesses and change their customer experiences. And you get teams that come together and they see a bunch of services released or they hear what others are doing and they go to the bar and they say, we're doing this, let's go. And they go back and they make a change. And that's what this is about, is trying to help people change their business. The original reinvent we went through 2013 up first. So I've been our 12 years. But the vibe feels like the old school reInvent when it was a smaller group and the energy was high. Um, and we're kind of on this AI generation. You can see some of the cards you guys are playing, the infrastructure advancements. But now with the AI, I have to ask you, you operationalize the cloud, build you know, greatness, turn the world on fire, create disruption. Okay, team, talk people moving backwards, documents, you operationalize everything. Now with AI, is that the same plan that you see? Because these builders are going to go faster going to have the AI at their, at their back. What's your, how do you look at this next uh, wave of clouds? Well, I think they're very much connected. You know, I mean, just perspective-wise, I mean, we felt like uh, we grew the AWS business really quickly, and um, it took us about eight or nine years uh, to build an AWS uh, annual run rate of about $4 billion or so. And uh, if you look at AI, that'll happen in just a couple of years. And so it's, it's growing incredibly quickly, but the reality is they're very much connected because if you, first of all, if you want to use AI, you have to have your data organized and architected in such a way that you can access it and try doing AI from a mainframe. It's, it's nearly impossible. So you really need to have your infrastructure modernized and in the cloud and your data accessible to run AI. And then the reality is that I think, when, you know, you've heard us talk for years about every application is compute, virtually every application is storage, almost every application is database and analytics and content. You know, another one of those core building blocks is going to be inference. Every application is going to have some generative AI and inference infused in it. And so it's very much a building block. And, you know, I, I also think that you don't show up and just have one big service that everybody uses that has all the features and presto, people can do it. You have to build the right set of primitives and building blocks that people can stitch together. And that's what we've been doing over the last number of years with SageMaker and with Bedrock and with um, our own chips that we think are going to help people be much more price performant in their training and their inference. And you'll continue to see that from us. When you think about the impact that Amazon has had of the industry broadly, it's pretty remarkable. John mentioned working backwards, customer obsession, two pizza teams, the flywheel concept, what I call Jassy's Law, there's no compression algorithm for experience. Two questions, has that changed? Is there a compression algorithm for, for experience in this AI era? And are there new sort of operational frameworks that are emerging as a result of this new era? Well, I, I think that um, the models, for, you know, 
It's not like people started working on these big transformer models two years ago. People were working on these, a lot of us were working on them for a long time, and the first several versions of the models just weren't that interesting. And then all of a sudden, really OpenAI's GPT-3, the intelligence level just kind of popped off the chart. And that opened up all sorts of possibilities. And I feel like the first real application that just exploded was ChatGPT. But if you think about ChatGPT, it, 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 it's kind of a pretty thin user interface on top of a model, it's remarkable. And uh, I think one of the things that people don't realize, I was talking about this in the keynote is, to build great generative AI applications, it's not fast, actually. You know, we, if you are building, uh, if you're doing a software development project, we can get on a whiteboard and map it out. And of course there are differences, but it largely functions as you design it. Whereas with generative AI apps, it's very iterative. Like you think you're going to make a big advancement in what you've done, and, and then it turns out you don't. You think you're making a, a, a tiny change and it gets much better. And so, you know, it's, it's very iterative. And then it's not just the model. I think people very often trick themselves with a good model that they think they're, they're there, but they're really only about 70% of the way there. And applications they don't really work well for users if there's 30% error rates or wonkiness. And so the UI really matters, the fluency, the messaging really matters, the latency really matters, the cost efficiency really matters. And so all of these things, it very much applies that there's no compression algorithm for, uh, um, for experience. And what, you know, what we tell a lot of companies, before the pandemic, companies were on this march to modernize their infrastructure and move from on-premise to the cloud. And the pandemic hit and we got into survival mode and then the, there was an uncertain economy and everyone was cost optimizing. And now as people start to spend again, people are asking us, should we, should we modernize our infrastructure or should we do generative AI? And of course the answer is yes, but if you don't take the low hanging fruit, of modernizing your infrastructure, you're actually not in a position to take advantage of AI, but you have to pick a few initiatives that really will change your business and get that muscle to build generative AI apps because it's not fast to be great at it. Andy, I want to get your thoughts on the infrastructure side because we've had this question on queue about building AI clusters, people trying to do it on-prem, cloud has advantages. Also on your queue, the word blast radius has come up a lot, so I know it's that Amazon term that James Hamilton and the team uses. It's hard to build large scale infrastructure. Uh, Dave Brown and I talk about that. Talk about the dynamics of the infrastructure at scale because you guys see stuff at scale that others don't. Things do break. Building a system power kind of apps that are coming, certainly they'll be able to be crazy, which you know, certainly a bedrock of some models, but to run it all, you need the horsepower. Yeah. Well, you know, we, as you know, we've been building very large scale infrastructure and running really the the largest workloads in the world for a really long time. And, and you know, I think that when you look at the ultra large training clusters that are being run, uh, they're, they're not simple. You know, they, and uh, uh, when you're running a cluster of a thousand chips, it's very different than when you're running a cluster of a few hundred thousand chips, like we're going to run for Anthropic and their, you know, their future models they're training on us. And, you know, I, I also think that uh, one of the biggest inhibitors in my opinion, for uh, generative AI applications to be as broad as they're going to be. Some of it is, is skill set and experience, uh, but, but a, a good piece of it is the, the costs need to keep getting lower, you know, and, and um, the cost of uh, the compute in, uh, and the chips in the compute, so you can do training much more cost effectively, uh, optimizing inference, which again is the cost of the compute, but also some efficiencies, and we've done a lot of inventing there, and so we, you know, as, as we are building very large scale generative AI applications inside Amazon, because we're building about a thousand of those apps already, as well as running them for large customers, we're getting really good experience. Even um, if you think about training, if, if you guys have looked at HyperPod in SageMaker, it's a radically different experience in, in what you can do on the networking side. And then if you if you take HyperPod and you combine that with what we're being what we're going to be able to do with Trainium with with ultra servers and ultra clusters, it's just a different level of scale to be able to train your largest models. Replicate that as, I mean, from a replication standpoint. I want to try to do that on Prime. Really hard. Really hard. So I want to ask you about some of the things you're doing at Amazon.com, and I want to talk about the market. You know, we love to talk about the market. So if you look at the market, and you just focus on the big three hyperscalers, maybe throw in Alibaba, I ask and pass. Amazon's got over 50% of the market, and it's maybe a couple hundred billion. 
John, years ago, when you and I first met in, in New York, wrote a piece, The Trillion Dollar Baby. So if you add in SaaS and all the, what John calls fake cloud, um, and, and the professional <laughs> services, that's what he calls it. You know, but, but, well, you add all, I'm a member but you add all that in, and, and it's, it's about almost 900 billion now, so and it's, mm -hmm. gonna, it's growing at whatever, 20%, so you undercount it. Well, trillion dollar baby. In there. So here's my question. So you're doing some really interesting things, and you don't participate really in the SaaS. I think our SaaS business is probably as big as yours, but, so, but you actually have things like Connect, I was going to say, Connect's kind yes, of in that yes, category, so yeah. So, but you're doing some other really interesting things applying AI internally yeah. that you could potentially, and will, I'm sure, point to the external world. Is that how we should think about your up stack sort of opportunity? Well, you know, I mean, what's interesting, I mean, something like Connect is an example. Uh, it's, it's, it was built from the ground up to be a, a, a a call center software um, service that um, was built on the cloud, that was highly scalable, was really cost effective, but also was built from ground up with AI. And if you look, if you look even in the last week at the features that Connect just launched, they continue to iterate at a very fast clip. And so, um, we we have a bunch of, I'll say supply chain is another area that we think we can be very effective in. We have a lot of experience just like customer service there. But I also believe that AI is going to open up all sorts of new SaaS opportunities and software as a service opportunities. I've been saying this for a long time, I've told you guys this too, which is that I think every single SaaS company and application that we know of will be reinvented with what's available in the cloud. And I think that's doubly true when you think about what AI allows. And that's a partner play. Yeah, that's a partner play. Well, I mean, the mar these market segments are so large. Mm -hmm. I always got a chuckle over the years that we would launch something in some area and people would theorize it was the end for these companies and it just never has happened. They're really large market segments with lots of winners and sometimes our customers will insist that we have an offering in a certain area, they really want it. But we also have lots of experience that even when we offer something, a lot of our partners in that same area are very successful on top of us. On a great experience with sellers, right? I mean, that's right. The scale. So to me, as you guys grow, you're in rarefied air. And I think one of the things that's coming out this year is the maturity of Amazon, of services in Amazon, is an econo economic force. So you're seeing things at scale, this is scalable apps, and now with all the horsepower, basically high performance computing. Yeah. And you're seeing new applications emerging. And you once said in the queue when I asked you, if you had to build Amazon again, what would you do? And you said serverless. Uh, I forget what year that was, but serverless has been popular. Yeah. It's an inference. So, will there be these next level apps that are going to take advantage of the high performance computing that are going to be inference lists or database lists? What do you call it? And serverless is serverless. Inference would be. Database lists or I, no, I think you'll still have database. You, databases serve a really important role, even with inference. But I, I mean, I think uh, I remember that conversation we had where you asked me if we were going to build it over again. I said I would do it serverless, and you were incredulous about that. <laughs> but I, I think. One of the things that's been really interesting, if you looked, we have um, metronomically over the last five years taken all of our analytics services and given people serverless opportunities. And then the same thing on the database side. And we were blown away at how much traction Aurora serverless has gotten in the last few years. And it was a really important part of how we thought about building Aurora DSQL. And you know, Aurora DSQL is, in, in many ways, it, I think it's a great AWS and Amazon example of how we think about building, which was, we were working on this concept when I was still in AWS, which was we knew that customers wanted a multi-region database, a relational database. They wanted strong consistency, they wanted low latency, they wanted high availability, they wanted SQL compatibility, and they wanted it to be easier to run. And all, there were a couple of options out there, but they were really only good at a couple of those things. And all the ideas we had were also only good at two or three of those things. And we kept getting down the road in, in, in the working backwards process and ripping it up because we just felt like we weren't really solving the problem. And so it forced us to kind of radically rethink how we did, a, you know, Werner went through in his keynote a bunch of the components that are in DSQL. No but locks. There's a lot, right, I mean, it's really, it's very inventive. And then we solved for the ant. You know, we solved for all of those components, and and it's a, it's totally serverless. And so I think that the large scale databases in the future will also be serverless. Serverless actually set the table in those ten year land anniversary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like as you guys say, inference is the next building block. I mean, that means something in your world. Right? Yeah. A building block significant 
it's like adding another major component. Yeah. What are the implications? Because serverless still ran on servers. Like databases are dead anywhere. So I see this as a developer touch point, an application touch point. What are the implications of inference as a building block? It's not just a service, it's a, a building block. Can you yeah. your vision of why as a building block is maybe impacted? Well, I mean, inference really is the implementation of, of uh, models and generative AI, if you think about it. I mean, they're the, they're the, you, know, you, you work on these models, you train these models, you try to be able to make predictions, and then the actual predictions are the inferences. And so what it really is another way of saying is that generative AI is going to be a very significant part of every application. And, you know, I, we, we talk about in generative AI, I, I, in the first year, year and a half of what was happening in Gender AI, it was so breathless and there was so much hand waving. And we have tried to be as clinical as we can be. And we, we knew what we were building. We were building like we always do a bunch of primitive building blocks and components that our customers can stitch together to build great Gender of AI and, and inference. But we have always felt like we were on this path in AWS to be, I don't know, a couple hundred billion dollar plus annual run rate type of business, and that was before AI. You know, that was before generative AI. I think that every single customer experience we know of is going to be reinvented with generative AI. And then I also think it's going to open up all sorts of opportunities and, and applications that we just didn't really dream were possible before. That's one of the interesting things inside the company, is when you start to see how the models work and you start to build great experiences, it opens up this explosion of ideas that people just didn't think was possible before. And so, you know, to me, the fact that everything's going to be reinvented and, and a lot of things invented for the first time with inference and generative AI is a huge opportunity for customers to build great customer experiences. Uh, innovation, experimentation, great serendipity, you mentioned being on whiteboards. I mean, this is kind of, we're in this really kind of experimental yeah. breakout moment. Final question, as you come back to AWS, the home, uh, for you that you build, that's what you build, and yeah. you build Godfather Cloud, what's it feel like? And then what do you hope happens as we document the next wave of cloud growth, changing the world? Well, uh, first of all, it's great to be back with you guys. I do remember the first time we met in that like dank conference room in New York City. And uh, I, I felt like you guys got the cloud in a way that nobody else had at that point. And I continue to, um, to watch what you guys do and say and think and theorize. And you guys are very on it. So, you know, so I, I always enjoy spending the time. And uh, you know, I would say, also, like I, mean, I appreciate the nice words, but it, as you know, anything that you that you build that has success, it's a group of people from the start. So I've been lucky to be part of this team. You know what I hope for in the next several years is that um, I mean, remember, as fast as the cloud has grown, it's still about 85 to 90 percent of the worldwide global IT spend is still on premises, which I think is insane. And I'm very confident that you fast forward 10 to 20 years from now, that equation is going to flip. So, I, and it will allow people to get more done for less money, to invent at a faster clip, and to get better productivity from their engineers, which is their scarce resource. So, one is we hope that we help people make that transformation. And then, when I think about the, the opportunities, this is a golden age in technology. I mean, we, we don't have, this is maybe the biggest change, for sure since the cloud, and probably since the internet with what's available and, and what the opportunities are in AI. And so, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we make it much more cost effective for people to be able to train models, um, to be able to do inference at scale. It's part of why people are so excited about training is it's just going to make it much more cost effective to do more with less. Um, I, you know, I would have told you, if you'd asked me 12, 15 months ago where most companies would, would operate in those three layers of the stack we talk about, I would have assumed almost everybody was going to only operate in the middle and leverage existing frontier models. But I really now strongly believe from our own experience that those with technical competence are going to do a lot of their own model building as well. So we're going to try and make this much easier for people to do. And then, you know, I, I, we're so early with respect to what the customer experiences are. I mean, uh, how long have we been talking about autonomous driving? Like, right? I mean, I remember talking about this with you 10 years ago and it's still not here in any broad way, although we're getting close, but there are going to be so many experiences that are going to be completely different for, for us, for our kids, for our kids' kids, They're going to, that are going to be great for society. And, and 
I'm optimistic that we'll be underneath a lot of them. I appreciate the compute and all the yeah. advancements. And that's the Renaissance for software. And again, congratulations. Thanks for having us. And great to see the Throwback Cube uh, reunion. It's great to be with you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Thanks. Here, special broadcast. I'm John Boyd. Thanks for watching. All right, Dave, that was Andy Jassy. John, that was epic. That was awesome. I saw a lot of people you know, texting me, how'd you get it? We, we kind of ruined some schedules. He, yeah. he, he wasn't planning on coming on the queue, but he made an effort, and if you heard him say he likes what we're doing, and being here 12 years, we saw it early, he recognized that, that we got cloud early, um, and I really appreciate his recognition to the SiliconANGLE team, our team, what we do, um, and to the tradition, I hope we can do this every year, but you know, Andy's one of those guys who's, who recognizes the quality, and it's really, I was personally, you know, as, as founders, we look at this and we say, you know, it's a moment where you, you kind of chalk it up for you know, private victory there, and it's like, hey, you know, it was a good thing. He's always been a great friend of theCUBE, and I think he recognizes that we provide a service, the, yeah. you know, our free content to the, to the community, and yeah. we've been embedded in a, AWS reInvent for, what, 12, yeah. this is our 12th year? 12th or? year, yeah. 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 We, uh, two more years than him. <laughs> 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 the guy who built it. <laughs> That's why I thought I won until he schooled me. Yeah, with he the, did. I'll just delist you, yeah. <laughs> de-invite you in two years and then we'll be even, we'll see how that goes. But no, no, we're good. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> give, yeah. him give him the shout out. Oh, <laughs> classic, down. classic Andy Jassy. Yeah. No, but I mean, I think, look at it, look at it. We've been here for 12 years and, and we were telling the story when it was misunderstood because we understood it. If you think about our documentary of the chronicle, chronicalized uh, this whole effort, um, it's a story that, you know, if you look at the archives, you know, our first reInvent, remember we had no, no guest list and we had the stream rolling the whole time. And we're like, are we still on? And they were like, hey, there's James Hamilton. And come on up. And he would come up and, you know, say his thing and unpack the entire back end. And next thing you know, when the PRs were like, don't put him on there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Get the lawyers he was ready. He, guts, guts, right? he was just like, I'm happy to tell you how cool <laughs> Nitro is. <laughs> Secret sauce. <laughs> we make it exactly like this. And he was so, he's such a great guy. I love that guy. And just and just getting to know all the people who really worked hard during those early years. And then they had a couple of years of like, you know, the the Jedi contract and a lot of dirty pool and the competitiveness um, came in and then you had that kind of like competitive arena and then obviously COVID hit and obviously Connect and big services kicked in, but they just never wavered. So it's, we see, interesting to see what happens on the next wave. Um, Dave has been great. And again, shout out to the team here. I think we've got over 40 videos. Um, we have over 55 stories already on SiliconANGLE. More coming, you got a bunch on thecuberesearch.com. Yeah. Full team coverage and again, great, great to see you Dave. And let's wrap Thanks, up John. the podcast. Great week. Thanks Good for job. listening. And, Get some sleep, and I'll be sleeping on the plane tomorrow. <laughs> I got a VIP. Uh, I like. I got a VIP. Uh, I'm sleeping tonight on the I plane. Got a VIP. Nice, John. Yeah, All right. the gods have been That's good a, to for me for the today. replay. Yeah, nice. That's always fun. Yeah, it's good to be up in the luxury sure. box, Dave. Yeah. You know. Well, that's where all, the, that's where <laughs> 12, all the action is. 12 years covering Riemann. This, we know the secret tunnels. <laughs> 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 good band. Zed's playing. So thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. This is the Q uh, podcast here at. Uh, AWS reInvent, thanks for listening and watching. See you next week.